Underwriting support for this program is provided by the Eureka Teachers Association's School Board Liaison, Philip Middlemiss. Thank you. Okay, are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are not. And we'll move to information, H6, student representatives report. Hi, my name is Chelsea Gratz and I'm Eureka FFA school board representative. We have had a busy past month. We had a booth at the Eureka High give you the hand in academic fair. While there, we shared what FFA is about in the agriculture industry. We also had our annual FFA school fair, where we attempted to improve ag literacy in the community by displaying our project animals, floral arranging demonstrations, and natural resources rural recreation displays. In addition, several students put on an agriculture mechanics activity showing their welding and heavy equipment operator skills. At our last meeting, we held officer elections, and the results were Vice President Alana Churchill, Secretary Sierra Holt, Treasurer Kara Klein, Historian Brooke Spencer, Sentinel White Nylander, ASB FFA Commissioner Katie Spellenberg, Sectional Officer Kelly Pedrotti, and I was fortunate enough to be elected to the 2011-2012 Eureka FFA President. <laughs> all these officers will be installed at our annual Spring Awards Banquet this Friday which you all should have received an invitation. If not, consider this your invitation. <laughs> um, we will be serving dinner at 6 at the Eureka High School cafeteria. I appreciate the opportunity to serve both the FFA and the school board over the past year. Thank you for allowing me to share our monthly activities with you. It is my privilege to introduce to you the 2011-2012 school board representative, Lauren Graydon. <laughs> to sharing all the activities we will be involved in in the next year. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Chelsea. Do you guys have any questions? I came up to your dinner and I tried to, to email and I couldn't figure out who to email, so oh. unfortunately I have another engagement. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> next year. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for all your reports <laughs> this yeah, year, Chelsea. Wonderful. We really <laughs> appreciate them. <laughs> we do. Any other st student representatives? Doesn't look like it. Okay, we'll move to superintendent's report. Um, what's being passed around to you is um, how far we've gotten on the Eureka City Schools Summer Professional Development Academy. Um, what you're being passed out is the sessions calendar our sessions are going to be going from Monday, August 8th through Friday, August 19th. Um, this is a mostly complete list, but uh, even now we're continuing to add things. Um, one of the latest is we're looking at how to add uh, a couple of days of smart board training uh, for our elementary teachers. But um, one, of the, one of the things that we've talked about um, a, a lot over this year is the essential program components uh, for our school district. And to, to me, to Cabinet, this Professional Development Academy uh, really supports the essential program components and, and the direction that we've been moving with Eureka City Schools. Um, just to name a couple of them, uh, one of the essential program components is the use of standards-based um, State Board of Education adopted materials. And if you look through this agenda, um, we are doing 
um, we are having sessions that support both California excursions um, as well as our mathematics. And uh, it's one of the commitments that this board made was to continue to purchase new textbooks for our students, even though those monies could be swept in other directions. Um, another essential program component is the use of uh, district instructional or assessment pacing guides. Um, we have both math pacing guides and, again, pacing guides for the excursions um, are part of the sessions that we're going to be offering. Um, another essential program component is both the continued training for both our school administrators and another one is the ongoing instructional assistance and support for um, reading, language arts, and ELD and mathematics teachers through the use of content experts, specialists, and instructional coaches. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're continuing to uh, provide our uh, employees, both administrators and teachers, the opportunity uh, to continue to expand their knowledge and, uh, and take that knowledge and then turn it into learning experiences for our students. Uh, and then another essential program component is uh, collaboration. And one of ours is actually how to use collaboration for results. Um, and then finishing up with a student achievement monitoring system. We have a data director for both beginners uh, as well as advanced. Uh, and then lastly, something that this board does is the implementation of fiscal support uh, to get the full implementation of our essential program components and by allowing our teachers the opportunity to do this as well as paying them their hourly wage to do so, which is something that we've all been behind. Um, we are using our fiscal support uh, to continue to improve what our teachers and what our administrators can do. Um, these sessions are open to board members and uh, the teachers and the administrators would really like to see you guys pop in and out if you'd like. Uh, you're not committed to the day, the two days, or anything like that. Um, I know that uh, there are certain sessions that cabinet members will be facilitating, but other sessions that we will also uh, just be popping in and out just to get a, a little taste of what they're doing and the direction that they're going. But we're really excited about this. Um, this is also available to other school districts in, in the county. Um, it was advertised at the superintendent's forum meeting, and it's also on the um, Humboldt County Office of Education professional development page. So anyone in the county that has an interest in one of these, um, they have the opportunity to, uh, to sign up and become a part of it. Uh, we have also guaranteed our teachers that if uh, they sign up by the 10th, that we'll get them their um, confirmation of schedule before they leave for the, their summer break. Um, and if not, they can always contact us during the summer. We're ready to go. Is this, are these held at the County Office of Education? Um, they're being held all over. We have some at the County oh. Office of Education and some of them that we'll be hosting as well, just depending on where we can get so a facility. you'll have another mm -hmm. we'll get you document listed. that'll have the Exactly place where they are, and, and yeah, we'll okay. continue. Place and time, yeah. Can I ask what the <clears throat> breakthrough coach training is? Um, breakthrough coach training is something that administrators and their administrative assistants participate in together as a team. Um, the desired outcome is that the uh, administrative assistant um, understands a little bit better the role of the administrator and the ways that they can support their administrator to take care of more of the office day-to-day -day functions to allow our administrators to be out and about in classrooms and actually affecting instruction. And so that's what some of the high school But that's for the high school, right? Um, you know, um, I, 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 Mickey and I will be attending that. Um, Rich and um, and uh, we have, in, we have uh, somehow I knew he would. Uh, all of our administrators and their administrative assistants or secretaries, our site administrators, and, and uh, three cabinet members attending. And that will be in, in San Jose. Mm -hmm. Great. If I could add one more thing. Um, if, I don't know if you've gotten an email yet, but if, if you desire to register, uh, I will send you an email with a link to SurveyMonkey. And then you register for any of these through Survey SurveyMonkey. Oh. Do we have to register for yeah, Do we have to go? No. Okay. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the um, pertussis requirement, um, the whooping cough re requirement. Um, Assembly Bill 354, which was passed in September of 2010, states that students entering or advancing to grades 7 through 12 in the 2011-2012 school year are required to show proof of immunization on or after their seventh birthday. Um, the reason I bring this up is because in the past, um, when the state has brought things like this to, to the public and said that thou shalt, um, there's always been a lot of loopholes and a lot of looking the other direction saying, hey, you don't have to, let's not worry about this. Um, Eureka City Schools and all the schools in the state of California have no choice 
but to not allow students into classes if they do not have proof of immunization um, prior to starting the next school year. Um, one of the reasons I bring it to the board is, um, first off, um, just in a FICMAC article um, that was sent out yesterday, the Corona Norco School District, which is a very large Southern California school district, and their latest assessment, 87% of their students do not have the immunization at this time. The other reason I bring that up and bring this up is also as, as we're out and about, all of us have the responsibility to continue to share this. It is on our website. It has been passed out to our students numerous times. Um, but we cannot allow students to enter school. Um, we, are, we are actually breaking the law if we allow students to do that. And for those parents that believe um, that there's a lot of exemptions to this, there are not. There are only two allowable exemptions. The first is a personal beliefs exemption. And it cannot be that you have previously filled out paperwork and therefore it just carries over. You have to actually go into the school and you have to fill out a brand new personal beliefs exemption. And then the other one is a medical exemption and has to come from a doctor and doctor's office and be signed and, and, uh, and of course they know how to, how to go about that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have talked, we have contacted the, the county health department and asked them if they're gonna be doing any, any type of mass clinics where they're gonna allow um, people to come through and they don't have any such plans at this time. And I also know that a friend of mine who has a student who's going to be an eighth grader next year uh, called and uh, they're now making appointments for late August um, at the pediatrics. So they're that far out right now in getting those immunizations. Um, it's gonna be really difficult for us to, um, to, well, it's not gonna be, it's gonna be impossible for us to allow students to even get schedules um, or do anything to enroll in school. So we really need parents to really get on this and move forward. We have no choice in this. This is eight, again, the grade. It is students, entering or advancing to grades seven through 12. Last year, last summer, um, the Humboldt County Fair, which is in August, the public health department actually had a booth and they gave the whooping cough shots hmm. there. Um, I'm wondering if they're going to do that again this year. And um, maybe they could do one at, is the Redwood Acres Fair being held as well? I'll ask, the last time you know, we, the last time we coordinated with, yeah, it's a, which would be, yeah. Yeah, the last time we asked, they weren't going to do anything. They, they weren't planning any. It's interesting. I don't know they did why. that last year, but not this year, huh? Well, what okay. is our mechanism to screen? Returning students as well as new students? Our, our mechanism for screening to allow students in? Um, when it's, they have the um, we, we held a training for um, all of our administrators and, and uh, school secretaries and others who may be inputting that data. Um, the requirement is that they go to their school right now where their student is enrolled, show that proof of immunization. It, it then gets put into the power school. Um, and then what we'll be doing over the summer is generating lists of those who do not have the immunization. Um, and at some point over the summer, we'll, we're already using the auto dialer. We'll continue to use the auto dialer. We'll be sending things home. And as we get really close, uh, it'll probably be a personal phone call home to people saying, hey, you've got to get this done. So we've got our end taken care of. Wow, we're ready. Great. So as we find out any information from either the public health department or even like, I don't know, Walgreens might be offering clinics, are we going to disseminate yeah. that information? If, yeah, if anyone has that information, we'll get it out on our webpage and okay. can also dis distribute it through schools or even, again, if it's, it's something that would really work out well for our students, we can even do auto dialers. Because I don't believe you have to have a doctor's prescription in order to have this no, one. You, you just can go to Walgreens mm -hmm. or CVS or one of those if They're they have them. Right. Okay. Costco has So it might be yeah. much easier to get it at Walgreens and with an appointment with right. your doctor. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. But until I just thought of that, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have clicked. Mm -hmm. So if we can get that information out to parents too. Um, last two pieces, uh, just an update. We'll be having a principals meeting tomorrow. Uh, we'll be talking about this professional development as well. There is an expectation that our administrators uh, will be attending and participating, like I said previously. Um, finalizing all of our summer school preparation, both for the credit recovery summer schools for junior high school and high school, as well as our jumpstart programs that are predominantly kindergarten uh, and continue in our discussion on staffing, we continue to move forward with that. And uh, just an FYI, uh, you guys were reminded last board meeting, but um, our Eureka High School music performance is tomorrow night at the Arkley Center. Doors open at 6.30, program starts at 7.15. That's all I have. 
Do we need tickets in advance for that? Or? No, you can buy them at the door. Okay, board members' report. Fran? Um, just by accident, I, I was at the, they were called the academic day, that was what it was called at the high school. The academic fair. I had to do some um, interviews for scholarships at the high school that happened to be on that day, and there was a fire truck there and all sorts of things. So I had some time to walk around, and it was wonderful. I didn't have as much time as I would have liked to have had, so next year, I'm hoping I'll know it that much. And they did announce it, but I just didn't realize what it was. But uh, anyway, the kids were having a great time. There was music. The, the quad was really being used. And uh, they were, the kids were really well behaved, and it was wonderful. And I did, we did interview um, five, four students, uh, high school seniors, for scholarships. And again, I'm just blown away by some of these wonderful students that uh, we have at the high school and their skills in being interviewed and, and their grades and, and the letters that they, and the letters of recommendation that they get from their teachers are well done and everything. It was a, a very, very, it was a great day. Hank? Okay. Wendy? Um, I did get an opportunity to go to the Arthur Center and see the, I guess it was the jazz band and the jazz ensemble, and they were terrific. So if you can get to any of these music, um, the, um, I guess the next two are at the Adorney Center, I mean the, at um, the Arkley Center. Um, they're just, they're, they, were, they were awesome. Uh, let me see, I did get to attend the Grant and Lafayette carnivals, and I'm really happy that Lafayette has gotten their carnival back up and running. Um, it was really fun, and I can understand if there's a couple of principals out there that won't be able to take me seriously for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. They had a, we had a great time. Um, I attended the last superintendent's advisory committee meeting two Fridays ago, was it? And I just want to say the parents that are involved in that are, are absolutely to be commended for their dedication. There was one parent there who hasn't missed a meeting. I think Gary Stillman's been on that committee for as long as I can remember. Our kids are in school together. Um, great information coming out of there, Greg. I, I really appreciate how you run those meetings. And maybe I'll see you next year. The um, Project Serve Committee that um, I am the board liaison to had its last meeting of the year and its last meeting um, period since the funding has run out and the position is now vacant. Um, service learning is going to continue in our schools because we have such a great tradition of service learning and um, I just want to say thank you to all those great teachers and Sue Murray who headed up the Project Serve um, has done a wonderful job. and. PTA district dinner was a couple of weeks ago, and I want to thank the principals that came and the dedicated PTA volunteers, of which we just never have enough of, and I wanted to say congratulations to Ron Pontoni, who received the um, Administrator of the Year Award from our, our sister district over there. He's retiring this year, and um, the PTA honored them, him with the Administrator of the Year Award, and it was a lovely dinner. That's it. John? Okay. Well, um, I attended the um, Alice Burney Open House, and the classrooms were spick and span. Everybody was on their best behavior. And the thing I was the most impressed with was the student writing examples that were on their desks. I mean, it was... It was I, I kind of challenged myself if I could guess what grade <laughs> they were by the examples. Great job. Um, I also attended the Zane Hydration Station ribbon cutting, which I know Wendy went to, yes, <laughs> um, which was kind of interesting. Um, you know, I'd never seen a, a, a little example like this, but it's, it was next to the water fountains, and you can fill your water bottles, so it's green, good, so you're not, you know, you're using your, and you're hydrating. That was what we were, that was the, the, issue with students getting enough water to drink. Um, the other thing that's coming up is the Lafayette walkability audit is coming up Monday, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Monday afternoon, so there should be a good group and I will report how that went at the next board meeting. 
And that's all I have. Um, is there any public comment on non-agenda items? I don't have any green sheets, so. Okay, hearing none, we will move on down to the consent calendar. Um, any questions or clarification by board members? Yes, thank you. Um, on J18, the uh, MOU with the Regional Police Department, the Regional Officer. Do you have a page number for us, Sam? On uh, page 27, uh, one Regional 10, Program of Termination. Yeah. Uh, this memorandum of understanding will be binding on both entities through June 2011. It's over. It's cheaper that way. You just point of clarification. I think that's a correction. We're going to make that a correction. Okay, any other clarifications, corrections? Okay, if not, I need a motion to approve the consent calendar with the correction to J18. I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the consent calendar with the corrections to J18. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Motion carries. Okay, we'll move. There's no discussion action tonight, so we'll move straight to discussion. L24, report on the governor's May revise. Um, the, the evening of the last board meeting, I took off over to Reading and uh, uh, went and uh, attended the school services uh, May revised budget. Um, Can we turn off that one turn more bank of one? lights? Sure, why not? Yeah. So you, you moved the principals from back there, and now they're not. Oh, well, we moved the principals from back there because they continue to play with the lights. Um, so I want to come back and talk to the board about the May revise, and and, uh, and as I told you guys before, the May revise is actually uh, pretty good news. Uh, it's not great news, but uh, considering some of the things that have been threatened for uh, schools um, overall. <laughs> Overall, it's, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good May revise. Um, and I'm just going to roll back because the May revision is uh, actually keeping with the general theme of what uh, Governor Brown proposed uh, when he came out with his January budget. Uh, and most of that was, it was an attempt to hold schools harmless. Uh, Governor Brown felt that schools had taken enough of the cuts um, over the past couple of years, and he was trying to keep them mostly harmless. But uh, as politics go, uh, Governor Brown kept one thing out there which was if he wasn't going to get a, his tax passage for the, uh, the tax extensions that he was going to have to hand that down to schools. And uh, you'll see that he's actually kind of pulled off of that. So it, it was still, um, he's still talking about the elimination of the redevelopment agencies, uh, which impacts Eureka as a whole. Um, he's still talking about the realignment of programs from the state to the local level. Uh, Governor Brown is very much pushed where it should all start going down to the local level and that the state government should stay out of more of the things that are being done. Um, but here was this big one. He wanted that extension of the temporary taxes by a vote of the people. And uh, as we all know, that he couldn't get enough Republican votes to move that forward. Um, so that one's just kind of hanging out there. Um, he tried to talk about relatively level funding for K-12 education. And uh, we'll see that that, that has continued. Um, however, community colleges and higher education are still having some significant cuts. And, uh, and those have remained in the budget. Um, some things have changed. Um, tax revenues have increased in the state. Um, the good news to that is that this was what people were calling and either had to be um, bringing in more money or cutting the money that we spent, and they were trying to balance that budget somewhere in the middle. A lot of the hard cuts were already made, so with more tax revenue coming into the state, that means that they have to have less of those tax extensions than they originally thought, or there's more money coming into the state. Um, works out really well for schools, because schools are, prop are funded by Proposition 98, and it's a mathematical formula that's based on the amount of tax revenue that comes into the state. Um, so it's good news for us. Like I said, he had no success in getting the Republican support for taxes. Um, and the community, or the state as, as a whole, um, really has a lot of pressure on our uh, state legislators for, um, for changes to pensions uh, and other reforms. So um, the big problem is that our, our state budget is still dependent on future revenues. Um, the state 
the development budget is only balanced if revenues are increased by some future event. So whether that's a tax extension or, or some other way, um, that's really the big what if out there. What if more money doesn't come into the state somehow, whether it's through tax extensions or something else. Um, and then the other piece that they're talking about is that they feel this is all part of what they are now calling electioneering. Um, and the electioneering we'll talk a little bit about in a couple of slides, but it's basically um, both sides of the aisle, the Republicans and the Democrats, both feel like they need to have one something. So as they go back to their communities and talk about re-election and other such things, they can say, hey, you know, we, we, did, we got this, you know, our party did this, um, so stick with us. Uh, and then lastly, um, they're saying that voters will not extend taxes to increase welfare payments or to increase funding for prisons. Um, so we can expect that education is still going to be that bright thing that our, our politicians continue to throw out as we need more money for education or you know, we can't have pets of education. Uh, we're still going to be a large part of the topic. So I just, you always have to use a slide that's got Rocky and Bullwinkle in it. Um, but our governor is, is traveling through some, uh, some pretty tough waters um, and it, it, it's all the pieces that I just talked about. So it's tax extension and a voter approval if that happens. Uh, pension reform is, uh, is really sticky for him out there right now. Um, bipartisan support is something he has just not gotten yet. Uh, and then this spending cap is the one that, that where the whole electioneering is gonna, gonna take place around. Both sides of the aisle are saying that they want a spending cap. And ultimately that spending cap could ultimately help us. Um, I used the slideshow in the, uh, in the um, Superintendent's Advisory Committee, and we have a, a, a parent from Alice Bernie who has a kindergartner and a second grader, I believe, and we had to explain to Rocky and Bullwinkle were in kindergarten. Yeah. Um, so the budget, the budget process that you guys are, are, are pretty well aware of, but I just wanted to roll through it one more time because it's what we have to follow. So we had, um, we had the governor who he was talking about the governor's flat funding proposal for 11 12. Um, first off, was a result of uh, $19 per ADA, um, a $19 loss per ADA to schools. And we all looked at that when the governor said it in January, and we said, okay, we, we can deal with that. We're not happy about it. But then his second piece was that, um, that he said that uh, there was a loss of Proposition 98 of an additional $2.1 billion if the temporary taxes were not extended. And he said if those temporary taxes were not extended, then the cut to schools would be another $330 per ADA loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, a total of $349, and at that time, school services was saying, you gotta do this, and that's exactly what we have to do. When the governor's budget comes out in January, we're required to take what he has stated and move that forward. For Eureka City Schools, that $349 per ADA is about a $1.2 million cut um, to what we received last year. So we were building budgets that moved us forward towards that. Um, through the spring, uh, virtually every day something new came out. Uh, the Republicans were going to cross the aisle, the tax extensions were going to happen, no they weren't, now they're going to take it off the table, now the legislators are going to do it on their own because they can with a two-thirds majority. A lot of conversations um, and it just kind of moved us around, but we still had to hold to what the governor said. You can't react to all the things that are happening in between and then the next piece is the May revise. So in the May revise, um, like I said, he's taken both this um, $330 as well as the $19 and that $349 and he's saying schools aren't going to get that. Um, they're not, we're not going to take that away from schools. So on we go. I said it was a good budget and, uh, and here's some of the reasons why. Um, there's less reliance on that tax extension. Um, now there's only $4 billion in election risk instead of the $12 billion. That's the difference in revenues that came in the state. Um, the tax extensions were first needed at 12 billion. Now they're only needed at 4 billion. And again, the governor's saying that even even if it doesn't happen through a tax extension, he wants to have it come out in other places. He doesn't want it to come out of uh, education. Um, the 6.6 .6 billion that came through the state uh, is wonderful news. It, it's it's new money into the state, and uh, very few people were predicting that we'd have new money. So uh, the cuts to the non-proposition side of the house have already been made. Um, so really that holds us harmly, harmless. And then again, Proposition 98 has risen. Um, deferrals might be moved. We'll see how that goes in the next couple of months. Um, but again, um, overall, we look a lot better in May than we did in January. Um, but we're not out of the woods. 
Of course not. That'd be too easy. Um, so again, the May revision acknowledges that there's a general fund, an increase in general fund revenues, um, so that there should be, there should be, according to Proposition 98, three billion more dollars coming to schools. And, and Governor Brown has said, okay, we're going to schools are going to get that three billion dollars. Um, we're not counting that money because the way he's talking about giving that money to the schools is not money that we'll see directly. He wants to do it um, in a couple of different ways. But the big one is he wants to reverse the $2.5 billion in the K-12 apportionment deferrals. In other words, that money that was supposed to be paid to us in one school year that through basically budget trickery, he said, okay, we're just, we're just going to pay that to you, but we're going to slide it into next year, and then we'll give it to you then. It was really, really difficult for schools because we still have to pay our bills. Um, we can't slide our bills into the next school year. Um, so what it was really creating was a problem with cash. And, uh, and so we started having to borrow from other funds to utilize the cash, but then make sure that we were giving back to that fund when the deferral finally did come through. So the governor's first thing, Governor Brown's first thing is he's saying we need to be done with all that trickery. And what we're going to do is we're going to slide that deferral back to where it belongs. Um, one of the reasons that we were really worried that the deferral would never come back is to the state, it's $2.5 billion. I mean, it's, it's a payment they have to make. Um, so we were worried that they would just continue to shove those deferrals down the road uh, and never really pay them back. But the first part he wants to use is that $2.5 billion in deferrals, so that will really help us out. Um, he wants to reverse $350 million in community college deferrals. Notice we get $2.5 billion, they got $350 million. Didn't seem quite fair. The other one that we're worried about is he wants to fund mental health and out-of-home care for special education students. Um, he wants schools to pick that up. Well, and, uh, and normally that's been picked up by the county. That can be really, really expensive for school districts with just one student. Um, in a district that's, that's our size, you know, a little less than 4,000 students, if we have you know, 20 students that have some severe um, mental health referrals that are identified by IEP, so you have to do them, um, and should, they're, they're beneficial for the student, but that can really cost districts very, very quickly, and that's really an unknown number until you actually start getting into um, the student's needs and, and how we need to go about that. So, although tax revenues were supposed to compensate today, uh, it's good news, but again, it's not money that we're going to see directly, and again, we had to explain to the parent who Mighty Mouse was. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, what'd you do? You knew what was sitting there. <laughs> um, the big thing is, uh, what both sides of the aisle want to win on is um, they, each side stating that they have put in a, um, a, a, a cap on state spending or to control state spending. Uh, the Republicans a long time ago were saying, you don't need to raise taxes, we don't need the tax extensions. All we have to do is cap spending and we'll be okay. Um, the Democrats were saying, yeah, we need to cap spending, but it needs to be a little bit from both sides. Um, so we're, it, what it's looking like right now is both the Republicans and the Democrats have come out and said, no more cuts to schools. Um, we don't believe that the 349 should go through to the schools. We think there are other ways to go about it. And both sides are saying, we think the way to go about it is through capping state spending. Uh, and the good news is it looks like both sides are going to take that as their win. Um, the Republicans are going to be able to go back and say, see, we told you. We told you we didn't need all that money in, in tax extensions, and, and now we're proving it, and so let's just continue to cap spending and we'll be okay. And the Democrats are saying, see, we told you more money was going to come into the state. We'd be okay that way because the economy's picking back up, and at the same time, we're, we're capping our spending. And so this is looking like the win-win so that both sides of the House or the aisle can go back home to their constituents and say, hey, we won something, and then we need to continue to build on this. So we continue to move forward. The big issue is, it's not a done deal. Um, and so in talking with the County Office of Education, again, we start in January with what the governor has told us to do. So we we're building a budget that had $349 per ADA less for Eureka City Schools. Um, we, um, we have a, a, a pretty healthy ending fund balance right now. So we knew we could absorb uh, a majority of that. And so Eureka City Schools made the decision that we would go less um, on the layoffs and, uh, and, the, and the dramatic cuts to our school. Um, we saw the light at the end of the tunnel and, and we projected that that light at the end of the tunnel wasn't an approaching train. Um, so we made that decision, took that tactic, and, and we went that direction. 
Um, the good news is, is that right now, unlike a lot of school districts, we aren't having to scramble back and rescind a lot of layoff notices um, because we didn't originally give them out. However, um, we have to go on what the May revise says. So the May revise says you're going to get that 349, but it's not written in stone yet. Uh, the, the budget hasn't been signed. Um, so what we're saying is the legislature really, really needs to sign that because right now, um, they're basically hanging, hanging schools and especially superintendents and boards out there because what our county is telling us is put the 349 per student on the bottom line, but don't spend it anywhere. So our budget looks really funky right now because it says, you know, it has expenditures, expenditures, expenditures. Our expenditures are a lot higher than our income, but then it's fixed at the bottom line because all of a sudden we're allowed to stick that 1.2 million back in the bottom line. So it makes our books look a little funky right now. Um, because we really should be taking that 1.2 and showing it up in the income and then the expenditures that go along with it that kind of evens out. Right now it looks like we're seriously deficit spending this year, but then all of a sudden you find it again in the bottom line. Um, so it's really kind of weird how they do it and we have to keep it that way up until the time that the, the state legislature actually signs the budget. The other piece of good news is, is again, it looks like they're going to have an on-time budget. Um, it is looking like right now the state legislature is going to continue to move forward and sign a budget on time um, that will really help us out. If this drags out again until August, September, October, again, Eureka City Schools, because of some of the decisions that we made, are in a lot better shape uh, than other school districts, but uh, it, it still makes our books look a little different and, and really hurts us for some long-term planning that we're looking at. And, and how we meet some of the needs that, that we're going to have coming up. So again, it's good news, but it's not great news. Uh, we need that signature on the bottom line of the budget by the state legislature. The other piece is um, they're really hopeful that a budget will pass on time because remember, our legislators don't get paid for every day there isn't a budget, and that, that isn't retro, so they don't get their money back. So if they don't pass the budget on time, they're working for free for a while. Questions? Not really a question, but can, um, can you either put that on on email sure. or make copies? Yeah. Oh, you or want the picture of the superintendent too? I don't mind too? if you put it on email and I have to print it myself, but one way or the other. I will get it to you. You know, I, I'll, I'll uh, attach it this right here. That'll be great. Okay. Anybody, I would think everybody would want it. And the budget will come to us um, at the next meeting mm -hmm. and uh, for our approval. And then, as soon as, well, assuming that the legislature signs off on the budget and it, we don't have to, we get the 341, mm -hmm. um, then we'll see that correction at. Um, most times you, it would drag out until first interim, but if it's an on-time budget, then we're going to turn it around as quickly as we can, and we'll have you guys adopt an updated budget. So the mental health costs that are normally picked up by the county, do we have any kind of estimate of what we're looking at? You know, we have a little bit, um, and Leanne can talk about that in special ed, but remember some of the things that are, that are taken care of by the county, we're unaware of. But, I mean, we have a we have a pretty good idea of no, some. I, I have a, I have a specific example of a district here in Humboldt County who their current share for the mental health costs of a student out of county is um, a couple thousand dollars because they only pay the educational fees per month. But if this is enacted, that district will have to pay the residential piece, which is approximately twelve thousand dollars per month for that student. That's how big of a hit it is. So how can we possibly work this into our budget? Yeah, really. I mean, you can't project it right now. Um, fortunately, we have very few students who have those services on the IEP. We always work very well with our county mental health agency, and so we've been able to be, we've been able to meet their mental health needs in a variety of other ways rather than attaching it into the IEP itself. But the problem is the mental health is taken going to be taken. If they big, take the hit, they're, they're going to be taking they're going to a big have hit. To turn it back to yeah. the schools, and they, they won't be able to support yeah. us like they currently are with uh, providing counseling support for kids. So this would have to be figured into next year's budget. Depends on if it passes, but yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions by board members? Okay. Any questions by members of the audience? Yes. How many IEP students do we already have in the Totally. We have about 600. So we serve a population from 3 to 22. So that includes our preschoolers and our adult students till they turn 22. Do you know how many we have in high school alone? High school alone, um, Probably about 150, 160. I'm, I'm guesstimating based on we have eight teachers and quickly trying to do the math of their caseloads. Do you know if that's increased over the last few years? It actually has gradually decreased. We're running about 11% of our student population are, have IEPs. And that's been pretty consistent in the 15 years I've been involved as director. It goes from 10 to 12 depending on the year. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? No? Okay, we will await the budget at the next meeting. Now we'll move to L25, Summer Maintenance Projects. For Summer Maintenance Projects, it's my pleasure to introduce Charlie Bettini, Head of Maintenance, who's going to run through the list that he has provided for you. Kind of an exciting year in maintenance. Um, <laughs> last time I was up here, we were wrapping up summer with uh, the gym roof project, so we finished that up. Uh, complete remodel of the girls' locker room side. Uh, some of our projects that we've completed during the year, that our routine maintenance has been installing a play structure at Alice Burney for the students there that we moved from Lincoln. Uh, we poured walkways at Lafayette, um, installed projectors at Zane. Um, and we're currently now in four major projects which are on our summer list. Um, we are building a resource uh, room in Washington's library. Uh, we are completing the P18 duplicating shock over at the Marshall Annex. Um, we had just begun uh, today starting uh, the baseball scoreboard down on the field. Great. And um, we're reinstalling auditorium seating on our earthquake project that we also had. Um, one area that we may be a little held up on the rain is we're looking to try and get the stadium bleachers painted before graduation like we always do, but we're keeping our fingers crossed for that weather. Um, some of the major projects we're looking for this summer, most are going to be done in-house. Um, obviously, the annex is a top priority on all of us. Um, at Alice Burney, we've hired extra painters uh, to paint the upper wing. Um, that is needed due to the fact of the air uh, conditions up there as salt and such that are rusting uh, a good portion of the metal structures up there. Uh, Lafayette is the next school that we're rekeying to our high security uh, key system that is registered to us only, so you cannot go down to ACE and get that key copied. So again, we will be uh, completing that this summer as well. Um, projectors again are going to be installed at Alice Burney and Grant this year. We also have some also installed at, at scheduled for the EHS Science Wing along with some smart boards in that area. Um, so those are our major projects that we're looking at. There are some maintenance uh, items on here as well. And any questions by the board from our list that we have? Can I ask about the about the parking lot at at Lafayette School? Is it that is it an in house? No, actually, that would have to be contracted out. Um, we have Matt and Velarga as the architect looked at that project. Um, right now it's still sitting in their court. Um, oh, we okay. have some drainage issues and such, but um, I have not seen an estimate yet on that. Okay. that problem. Thank you. So the Marshall Annex, have, we're putting them out to bid now? Yeah, actually the uh, first bid notice went out this last Sunday. We will have another bid notice go out this coming Sunday. <coughs> we will have a bid walk on Tuesday. And then I believe it was the 16th is the bid opening um, with the going to the board on the 22nd meeting of June for you guys for approval. 
And so, assuming we approve a, a, one of the bids on the 22nd of June, what's your estimated timetable for construction and move in? They would have to get their uh, contractors and bonds in. I wouldn't see them starting work until after the 4th of July. Uh, we're shooting for, we've talked about staging the project. Um, that way we can get accounting head services, those offices up and running. Um, one of the major uh, construction areas in there is going to be towards the boardroom, which would be in the other hallway. There's a two-hour fire separation that needs to be installed in there because of the occupancy use and, and uh, raised to the codes. So that construction can be done while we are still working in that facility. So we may not be completed with the project, but we could still be up and running as a district office. As of? Well, we're shooting for, for mid-August. Mid-August, okay. That's when our, we're, we're talking with a, an install on the furniture uh, for built-ins, so that's what we're shooting for. Okay. Wow. Any other questions of board members? just want to say the walkways at Lafayette look so much better now, that whole area. What an improvement. Any Anybody in the audience? No? They got me earlier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Okay, we'll move to L26, Curriculum Adoption Biology. And for the Curriculum Adoption, it's another Dr. Lawrence. Thank you. It's my pleasure to uh, present to you in just a moment, Mark Bailey, who will be uh, giving us uh, an overview of the recommendation for biology for the high school. As you can see in your green sheet, one of the main reasons is the uh, current book they're using is over 17 years Thank old. <laughs> <laughs> I would also like to point out to members of the board, uh, in the green sheet towards Thanks, the bottom, there are two pricing options, and this uh, is presented to you at the recommendation of the curriculum committee because after we had a chance to take a look at the textbooks themselves and pass them around the table, we realized they're very heavy. Yeah. But it, it, to purchase classroom sets, of course, uh, carries a cost. Mark? You can test the heavy. So, as Rick said, we have uh, ancient textbooks in biology and uh, we needed to replace them for 16 years. <laughs> um, we went through a fairly exhaustive um, assessment of what's out there. There's a lot of kind of equalness of textbooks out there and um, some pretty bad ones. And uh, we ended up looking at several and came down to two and it was kind of a flip of a coin. In the case of this one, um, the company gave us two classroom sets uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, Lucia Boyer has been piloting that in her room, and she really liked it. And uh, so we all looked at the textbooks, and you can see our assessments of them there. Um, we all thought it was great, and uh, so we're requesting her to go with that one. Isn't this the book? Isn't Phil Barnum also using this book? Yes, they are. So that's good. Yeah, so it's uh, it's been used now for at least a couple of years. And she's like very happy sites. with it, according to what I understand. <laughs> yes, it's a really good book. Mm -hmm. And it comes with a lot of supplemental materials, a wide variety, and, and mostly free, um, depending on how many we get. And uh, the thing I like is... Um, online textbook access for the students. So for every copy that we buy, um, one student gets to have online access for an interactive textbook online. Um, lots of other things, uh, lab <laughs> manuals, which we may or may not use. We have a pretty good lab program already that we really like, and we finally got it integrated in, in, in all of the instructor's classrooms. So uh, we like it. <laughs> We definitely need to add the classroom sets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want my kid pulling us back and forth. And I'm assuming we have the money, or you wouldn't have asked for that. Yes, it's budgeted. Okay, I agree. 
Guess out the classroom of, sets. Out of the 40 chapters. Pardon? Out of the 40 chapters, how much is contained in one year of biology? <laughs> Um, ideally, all of them, um, <laughs> but usually probably two-thirds that in actuality. Um, we, we have a pretty experienced biology teaching staff, and so we've been able to work with the state curriculum standards pretty well now, and we've been able to weave through and find out, um, prioritize. Where will lighten up within this curriculum? Um, nothing. Um, just intensify what the, the amount of time we're spending on each. Um, there's not really any room to lighten up on anything. Um, well, but these textbooks are always made to be more full than, and from my experience with biology textbooks, which has been about 30 years, they're always more full than you can possibly cover anyway. Um, there's a lot of material that, um, in a typical textbook that, that needn't be taught and still be in alignment with state curriculum standards. Um, we, can, we can weave several subjects together and, and be in alignment with state curriculum standards. Mm -hmm. So we're accustomed to doing that, and it's something we've always had to do. Any questions by anyone in the audience? No? Board members, are we okay with moving this? Okay. Thank you very much. This will be on our next agenda on the consent. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Now we're to L27, Curriculum Adoption, the Language of Composition. And again, this is a, a high school uh, proposal for adoption. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Ben Henshaw, Donna Doherty, and Bill Middleus, who made the presentation to our curriculum committee. And after, uh, after quite a lengthy discussion, the curriculum committee uh, unanimously, unanimously approved uh, recommending to the board adoption of the language of composition. It is, uh, and I'll let the, uh, the teachers explain why this is such a valuable textbook for the 11th grade English program. Good evening. How are you? Good. Fine, thanks. Good. Well, here we are. We made it. Uh, this is the, uh, the three junior English teachers from Eureka High, Don Dory, Philip Novus, and myself. And uh, a little bit of background. We haven't had a reader for, the last reader we had was a viewpoints reader, which I believe, I thought it was mid-70s, but I think it's section 1981. Um, I've used it sparingly over the years, but they were so beat up and trashed that uh, there's just no point in pulling them out. So uh, that's one of the problems with, with the present material. Also, uh, this course used to be comp two for years and years, and it was a semester course. And in the last couple of years, we've moved to a year-long course. Obviously, with that in mind, we need, feel like we need a reader that's going to prepare students for that next step. This is a this is a challenging reader, and we realize that, and we know that one of the our tasks is going to be over the summer to get the setup, to differentiate, and work on the trying to scaffold these lessons so it is accessible to all levels. And we think it actually presents itself very nicely, even though you look at it, it looks it looks high end, but the essays in there are quite accessible. They have classic, we may have seen some of the things that are going to be presented here. Um, there are, uh, it starts off each section uh, thematically arranged, and then it goes into classic essays, and then for a central essay, and a classic essay, which is sort of a, a dated essay that relates to that theme, and then there are, <coughs> excuse me, a series of other essays, and including student essays, poems, uh, fiction excerpts, but a lot of this really revolves around nonfiction, which is what students are going to be geared towards in much of their college writing. So uh, that's kind of where we start. And I better be quiet. Um, if I can just give you an example, if, uh, if those of you who have a book nearby, if you can turn to the education theme section, which is the first uh, actual chapter, um, and what they do is they provided within that chapter 
12 different short readings, all on the theme of education. And one of the great things about this text is that the readings are at different levels. They're also different genres. And so what we're excited about is being able to use this wide selection of readings as a way to differentiate. So if we're working on the education section, students can be assigned different readings on the same topic that suits their uh, level. But we, as a class, we can all be speaking of, about the same issues. Uh, then there's a wonderful um, targeted grammar section at the end of each, and it references the readings. And so all of the grammar exercises are directly tied in to what the students have been working with as far as the fiction and nonfiction literature, which for me is really exciting because it really makes sense and it's very targeted. Um, another thing that I'm really excited about with this text and the, there's a teacher supplement, a workbook that's going around as well. And what that puts <coughs> in it is these wonderful assessment tools where there are short selected readings, uh, three to five readings, and then a prompt. And so what students are asked to do is synthesize a position after looking at the short readings, then synthesizing a position, and then there's a writing prompt in which they're asked to support their informed decision using references to the material as their support. And this is exactly what colleges, whatever subject, are going to ask our students to do, to be able to recognize the complexity of an issue. So it's not just one piece, it's three to five pieces that show the complexities of the issue, then to formulate their own position, and then to support it with sources, not just how I feel today or what I've seen. So uh, junior English is the last year-long English class that they have. And what I notice in my juniors is that's the year now, some of them have already decided they're going to college, but a lot of them are really on the fence. They're not sure yet, am I college material or not? But with this textbook, what's exciting is at the end of that junior year, we could say, all right, the material you've been working with is truly college prep. If you were able to master this material and master these skills, you will be able to handle college. And that's an exciting thing to be able to tell students at, and they still have that year to make their decision. Uh, I don't have much more to add to that, other than the fact that uh, you're looking at about uh, 75 years, 80 years of uh, accumulated experience <coughs> all at Eureka City Schools. And uh, the fact that the three of us are teaching junior English is, is pretty cool because we're the ones who are launching uh, those going into uh, the senior year, obviously. But the senior year is, is uh, divided into uh, multiple classes and mostly their electives. A few of them college prep and a few not college prep. This is their last, probably for all of them, the last college prep class they're going to have. So the, most, the more we can do with them, the better, because hopefully it will stick. Um, I'm just excited about this book for a number of reasons. Mostly it's because it's going to be the glue that sort of holds us all together. And in terms of planning together, in terms of creating a, a structure that is solid and year-round um, is, uh, I think, really important. It's the one ingredient that's been missing in the junior English curriculum. So this is, uh, this is a good opportunity. And uh, I think it will focus uh, the curriculum with the three of us and the fact that we like one another and that we desire uh, the company of one another is, uh, so far, is important. And I think that's probably the best thing that this book is, has done, is, is brought us together and made the curriculum a lot more solid. Or will. Or could. I think it speaks to that, that word that we hear a lot of fidelity, and I think it will bring the 11th grade together, because it hasn't before. It's been sort of you know, that independent contracting. And even though we talk about this, when we collaborate, it's, We've sort of been coming at it from different angles, so we're kind of excited to say, here we are, okay, let's, let's, let's focus on that. So I guess it's going to be real positive for the whole year. Can I ask a question? I noticed that the, I like the sections that it's broken into. It has some wonderful, and I particularly like the one on sports and fitness, and the one on Joe DiMaggio. But 
One of the things that I was impressed with in this particular uh, sports and fitness, there's also a list of films that have, that have you know, oh, classics cool. and, and like um, Chariots of Fire and Bend It Like Beckham and all of these things. Do all of the chapters basically have some every unit that has kind a of huge supplemental section, uh, not only films but also novels? Yes. And all the novels oh. that we teach are all right. mentioned in the book. Good. So that'll be really uh, uh, yeah. very convenient to match the novels we've already purchased with the textbook. Um, and then there's also uh, other other literature that's not included in the text but is, is listed as a supplemental. Yeah. This is there's wonderful. Great cross-references in there in the, in the manual really. Yeah, it looks good, good to me. Mm -hmm. And our, our course has been structured thematically. Uh, for example, I've had technology and appropriate technology uh, for mine for the last couple of years. And Donna's had food and all the social psychological aspects around all those themes <coughs> and sort of building with that. And more or less all of those in the book also. So not only can we continue with those themes, but we can start expanding into other things. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's, a, it's a real good opportunity. Well, just reading, look good. Perusing that book, it made me want to take the class again. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. And you guys are pretty excited about this, too, so great. Um, any other questions? Members of the audience? No? Board members? We're good? Exciting. <laughs> this will move on to the consent agenda of our next board meeting. <laughs> Okay, we're down to L28, report on changes to Eureka City Schools Alternative Education oh. Program. Um, this is taking us all the way back to um, <coughs> the board meeting of February 16th, and at that time, I made the recommendation that we close Humboldt Bay High School, and in doing so, um, to really uh, take a, a long look at what we're doing at uh, in all of our other alternative education programs and um, what what resulted from this is um, a good conversation between um, members of cabinet and, and administrators and uh, as actually a, a large group of people as what we really wanted our alternative education center to look like and how we would better meet the needs um, of the students that we currently have and yet remain flexible enough that we can continue to meet the needs of the students we don't know we have yet um, so we felt, or I felt, and then uh, gathered the support of uh, Rick Jordan from Eureka High School, um, Sherry Jensen from Zoe Barnum, um, Sandy Phillips joined us from Adult Education, um, Rick, or Rich, and uh, Leanne as well. And we thought the best way to talk about this would be to put it in a, a flyer as to what we're going to do in this program um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, we wrote this flyer uh, to the students. These are students who need to take control of their own learning um, and in doing so uh, we want to empower them to start to create the type of program that they want to see uh, to get them to their goals uh, and also we want our students to be able to use this um, to support them when they are approaching staff members who they feel may have a less than enthusiastic attitude about the program that they would like to see us develop um, for those students one of the pieces that we talked about um, was that unfortunately the name Zoe Barnum has, has gathered a, a negative connotation in our community. And uh, as I participate in Rotary and, uh, and also participate in other um, functions with professionals in this community, um, I found that to be true time and time again. Um, I actually had the owner of uh, two very prominent entry level positions tell me that they would not hire any student who came to them with a Zoe Barnum diploma. Um, and they really couldn't articulate why and, and were very surprised when I had a conversation as to what some of the reasons students are, are participating at Zoe Barnum. Uh, so again, we, we moved forward with this flyer and in doing so um, came up with a name change. And uh, although we are not, uh, uh, th this name change isn't in cement, um, I wanted to build tonight's presentation a little bit on uh, what we call the Eureka Learning Center. Um, 
and, and kind of talk about why, why we chose that and, and what it meant to us and what it, we hope it means to our students. Um, first off, and I'm going to go from the back to the front because it's just a fun thing to do. Uh, and I'm going to start with the word center. Um, our, our desire and, and, and you know, center is, is the source from which something originates. And that's our desire is that uh, when our students come to this center, that all of the things that they need are orbiting around them. Um, that they're the center of attention and that their needs and their desires to graduate um, or go beyond graduation, um, they're the center and all of the programs that we have um, are orbiting around them and are able to come in and help them in the areas that they need. Um, we have all the components necessary for students to earn credits through graduation and, and the really disappointing part is we've had them for a very long time. We just haven't coordinated them very well. So again, by having the student as a center and making sure that all the programs circle around the student and coordinate to work for the benefit of the student um, is a very important piece of that. Um, some of the pieces that we have in place um, and need to start working better together, uh, first off is our continuation high school. Um, in the brochure, we're very careful to say that the continuation high school is one alternative to our traditional high school. It is not the only alternative, it's one alternative. Um, Eureka High School is still an alternative. They may not be a full-time student there, but they can still earn credits through Eureka High School. They can utilize career tech programs, they can utilize adult education programs, they can utilize ROP programs, they can utilize independent study, and one of the ones that we're really starting to delve into a little bit more is how can our students start to utilize um, accredited online programs to get them to graduation and how can we then with them as the center utilize all these programs to custom make a program for these students so that they get to graduation. In this flyer we use phrases like together we will build a program. In other words we're not you're not these students are not coming in and we have program A, B or C you take your choice it's what do you need, how can we work around your schedule, what are your desires and how can we get you there and together we will build a program. Uh, another phrase that's used in this is in an effort to support your goals. So these programs we're using together in an effort to support the students goals. It's not what do we want for you, it's you're coming to us because remember these are juniors and seniors for the most part. These are young adults and it's time for these young adults to take ownership of what they want to do, how they want to get to graduation and move in that direction. And then the other one that we use is that together we will complete your path to graduation. And it has to be their path. Um, a lot of the students that, that we get in an alternative program are the students that the traditional program did not work for them for a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of people want to immediately blame the school and that's, that's not always the case. A lot of people want to immediately blame the student and that's not the case either. Um, some of these students have some, some real interesting stories and some real interesting circumstances, some within their control um, prior to them being able to make better decisions and some that were completely out of their control and so we want to work together with them. Um, the second word is, is learning and I, I really appreciated the, the presentation. Um, from both uh, our science department as well as our English department. Um, we continue to follow the essential program components model and every single time new textbooks have been brought to you for the secondary level, we are always including Zoe Barnum or the continuation high school as well as independent study in those programs. Um, this is not just the easy way to graduate. This is a, a rigorous program that we're trying to make relevant for our students. This isn't the program where you just drop in for a while from you know, sometime between 9 and noon and then you're out of there and you still get to graduate from high school. Um, our expectation and the expectation that, that Sherry Jensen and others have really brought to that school is that this is a, a very rigorous curriculum and that it very much follows what the high school is doing. It's just being presented in an alternative way. It's not an alternative education, it's being presented differently. That's really important for a couple of reasons. As we have students that transition out of Eureka High School into this model, we want to be able to pick up where they're at and continue on with that if that's, if that's something we can do. And conversely, if we have students who, who go to the learning center for a while and work their way out of it, catch up with credits, we want them to be able to seamlessly come back into Eureka High School and potentially graduate with their classmates if that's what they desire. So this is not just the easy way to graduate. Some of the things that, um, that uh, Sherry and her staff are talking about is a longer school day. 
with more opportunities to earn credits, more frequent checks on student progress and how their program is working for them. Um, even talking about something as frequently as a daily check-in period, almost like homeroom, where the teachers have their small core group of students and they're making sure that their needs are being met and we're continuing to move them forward. And then more structured transitions both in and out of the program. It's not like you can just walk out of Eureka High School one day and the next day show up at Zoe and say, hey, here I am. It's if the decision is made that that person is going to leave Eureka High School and or they just come into the learning center for, for um, a better way to meet their needs. We need to do a needs assessment. We need to know where that student's at, both credit-wise, um, graduation-wise, and we also need to know where they are skill-wise, again, so we can start to talk with them about the different ways that together we can build that program. Um, so every single time we start talking about books or, or programs for our secondary schools, we're always including the continuation high school in that. Um, and then the first word is, is Eureka. Um, We've been beat up a lot of times um, for claiming that we're the leaders on the North Coast. And, and we weren't claiming, we were striving for, and we're continuing to strive to be the leaders on the North Coast. And, and, and quite honestly, um, we're very proud of being Eureka City Schools, and so we want Eureka in that name. We want them to know where they are, where they're going. But also, we want to carry on the work that's been done by the Zobarnum staff over the last couple of years. Um, and in this flyer, we state that we have high expectations for student achievement. Again, this isn't just the easy way out. We have high expectations. We want to push these kids as far as they'll let us push them, and we want to get them to graduation as quickly as that the two of us or the, you know, us as a group and they as a student can work together along with their family if they have that support. Um, we have programs that are specific to each student. Again, we're not just throwing you in classes because that class is available. We're putting you in a program that's going to meet your needs. Um, we have a caring, knowledgeable faculty, and at times um, they've been hammered a little bit for being at the continuation school. Um, but go to their graduation and, and listen uh, to the student testimony about, about what's going on with those students. Um, I will, by the way, tell you that my daughter who graduated from traditional high school would say the exact same thing about Eureka High School. But we have a knowledgeable staff, and they work really, really hard. The flex flexible class schedule is the big one. If we have a kid who needs to work in the afternoon, that can't be a barrier to that student graduating. We have to look at how can we get them in some morning classes, how can we get them in some adult education classes, how can we get them in some online classes. Whether that online is taking place at home and we're able to check in because it's an accredited program and or it's something that we're having them complete when they have time to come to our lab and be able to do it. Um, the sky is kind of the limit and that's why we really wanted to throw in that online component to it because again, um, we can look at the students we have right now, but we want this program uh, to really remain flexible to meet the needs of our students. Um, the last piece of this is um, I, I looked up the word alternative in the, in the dictionary, and we're moving from one of the definitions to the other because our previous definition of alternative was the first one, which is a choice limited to one or two possibilities as of things, um, of courses of actions. So in other words, we had like you could do this or you could do this. And unfortunately, um, too often it was you can take it or you can leave it. Uh, and that wasn't the right way to go. What we want to do now is, is get to the point where alternative means we're employing or following non-traditional or unconventional ideas and methods that exist outside the establishment. And the establishment just being Eureka High School. And it's important to remember that Eureka High School is still meeting a majority of our students' needs. Um, but we can't have those kids that are falling through the cracks and we can't have those kids that are missing anymore. And it's really important that uh, we kind of start to blend that model more as we move those students over from Humboldt Bay High School over to the Eureka Learning Center, um, that we meet all of their needs and continue in this direction. Whew. Questions? So the uh, high school portion of the Learning Center, what do you anticipate the enrollment to be? and how many teachers? I, I don't understand your question. How many high school students do you think will be in this program at the Eureka Learning Center? You know, I don't know. Right now, um, um, and sure, you're going to have to help me on this, but right now, Zoe Barnum is hovering probably somewhere around 55 students. I'm sorry, 70? Because we are under the 80. We're going to be adding another staff member to Zoe um, or to the Eureka Learning Center, so we're able to move that number up. Uh, it's our goal that we're up somewhere around 100 students. So less than what Zoe and Humble Bay has today? No. 
No, we're right about the same. We'll be able to accommodate about the same amount of students that we have between Zoe and Humboldt Bay. Uh, because remember, we have, those, we have those seniors moving out, so we just have the junior class that's coming in, and then we'll continue to create room as sophomores come up. Um, one of the things that we're going to be able to do is, is have more enrolled students in the program because what limits us is, is the number of students in a class. So as we have more students that branch out into adult education or one of the other alternatives, um, it'll free up some seats in the class. So although it may look like by contract we have a hard cap, we should no longer have a hard cap because of the flexibility of the programs. So Zoe has 70 and Humble Bay has 40 and, and so this new program won't be any larger. It could be. It, it just depends on what we need. Um, in the beginning, we don't anticipate it needing to be larger. So again, adding another staff member to, to the current staff that we have, we can go up to 100 students um, by contract limitations. Um, but then we can also go higher than that because of the flexibility of program. And then if this is something that becomes incredibly successful, we look at an over-under model. Um, are we now overstaffed at another school? mainly Eureka High School as a result of that, and we, we, we have the ability to slide staff members over. I have in a question. In 1919, uh, first continuation school started called Gompers in Richmond, California. And it was designed for working students. Uh, it was designed for students that had to work. And, all continuation schools have always had a large component which was work experience. That's not mentioned anywhere in the flyer. We do have work experience, so I will make sure it's there. Family needs, students with families, uh, students that have to work to support their families. There's, those components have always been a large part of the continuation program. I like the, the, the diplomas within your reach, and I like on the front getting students to graduation. And I'm glad you're going to change some of the articles. <laughs> <laughs> what is the difference in the two diplomas now? Is it number of credits or specific kinds of credits? Um, it's both. Uh, the, a student who is a continuation student has um, fewer credits to earn. Uh, it's predominantly elective credits that they don't have the requirement to meet as many elective credits. Do they still have the uh, physical education requirement? Mm -hmm. Same as the mm -hmm. And most of the most students, most students. Uh, by the time they get to um, a continuation high school, have normally completed the, the, the PE portion, although with the change in the rules now, um, there's, there's probably some more that are going to straggle over that need it. But we still, we offer a PE program. The, um, there's a lot of sentences that say, together we will build a program for you, and you've repeated that throughout here. So... Where is, who are the employees who are the part, who, who help the student build their program? And the answer has to be, and it's something that we're going to have to do, the answer has to be everybody is a part of that team that builds. Um, one of the pieces that we're talked about is, is um, students who are checking in with one of their teachers uh, on hopefully a daily basis. And, and hopefully that opens up a conversation as to, you know, this isn't working for me or this change is coming in my life or this change has happened and, and what are some of the options that I can, can throw at this. But primarily um, we have um, Sherry, the, the school administrator who, who works with students directly on a continuous basis. Sonny Phillips works with students on a continuous basis. Uh, we have a guidance tech over there and then we're also looking at, at the potential of a, we're looking at other potentials that, that might play out some of those have to be negotiated and some other changes have to be made, but we're trying to be um, really, um, we're really trying to keep in mind the, the need for students to be able to come in, check in, and, and get pretty significant changes to their schedule in a short period of time. Or just talk to someone mm -hmm. and say that. So if I'm a new student and I walk in the office, who do I talk to? Who's, who's the... 
One of, one of the pieces that, uh, that Sherry and her staff are working on right now is, is how do we transition students in? And again, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, it's, it's important that we have a little bit of lead time so that we can look at credits. And if they're coming from our high school, we can look at what they have in full credits and partial credits. But if it not, it, it normally requires that we have a little bit of time to get their transcripts from somewhere and have somebody who's trained to have a, have a real professional eye trying to pull out as many credits as possible and develop that graduation plan. Um, so we have, we have people that are able to do that. But the, the idea of a transition is so that we have time to set all that up and, and have real definite start times to when students roll into um, the continuation high school. And of course, there's always, you know, always going to be some of those that, that it's, it's a real quick need and we've got to get that person in right away and we'll have to figure out some type of transitional credit earning. Um, and they've done that over the past couple of years too with, with uh, the ability to come in the program and work for a while that, that translates into credits. So we'll remain flexible on that. But I guess I'm wondering about a checklist of some kind in the office that, you know, new student comes in and whoever is working with them is ensuring that they've checked this and that and, the, you know, all the things that the student needs to be successful. It seems to me that the student that goes to a school like this needs to know that there are adults who know their name, who are helping them, you know, so that they don't fall but between the cracks because that's probably what happened to them before. Um, so I, I get a little worried about it getting too big, but is that is that a goal? I mean, is, am I? I think if you, if you I'm, I'm currently coming in as a new student into our office, you get greeted by a warm secretary, and if I pop out of my office, I say hello. And so you get that personal thing right from the beginning, if you're coming in on the continuation end side. And we start talking to the students right away and tell them about their registration packet. And it is a process. Now, we're hoping to streamline it to lessen the impact on the academic program so that possibly maybe like every other Monday is actually the day that the students would go into the classroom. <coughs> But prior to that, they would have come into the office, talked with us, we would have looked at their credit needs, um, had an intake, learned about the rules, done some hopefully some pre-assessments on their skill levels so that the teachers could immediately start putting them in the best instructional um, realm for them. Mm -hmm. And then they'll go in. So if we had two students coming in on one Monday, they'd be going in with another student into the program, and the teachers would have already had their names on the goal sheet. So I think that that personalized component is really important and that they would feel very welcome as part of our school community. If they needed extra time, we would have taken them over to the adult ed side to do concurrent enrollment. Um, so it's all part of the process. If you came over right now, it's already like that. We all talk and, and kind of hand people off and help them do the paperwork. So That's what I... Great. Great. Sounds good. <laughs> One of the past issues that was difficult to deal with was the student who had basically not acquired any credits in the freshman or sophomore year, or a large portion. Uh, so talking about having a focus on juniors and seniors, is there a component to pick up, or where is the handoff on the sophomore who has 30 credits at the end of the year? Well, at code with alternative ed, we can only take 16-year-olds and up. So those are the student population that would be in that continuation school model at this time. And my question then, is there any place in this alternative school setting, or what is the mechanism for dealing with uh, uh, underclassmen in high school? If we have students who... First off, it's a, a large part of that responsibility falls on Eureka High School. Um, we, we've talked a lot in this, at this board about what we're doing with intervention programs um, and, and how we're continuously assessing our students and looking at where they are through benchmarks to better meet their educational needs. If we have a student who has just completely fallen out, um, unfortunately, a lot of times it has a lot to do with attendance, and, and there's ways to fix that through SARB. Um, but a lot of them are also um, severe behavioral issues at that point. 
and really a lot of those fall out of Eureka City Schools and then are picked up um, because normally there's an association with EPD or the Sheriff's Department or someone like that and they end up at a community school. For those really, really rare students who have just for some reason shut down completely academically and they're still below 16 years of age, um, what we're going to have to do is start utilizing components of the Learning Center that are still allowable by Ed Code. So what we're going to have to look at is how do we meet that student's needs through home and hospital, um, if that's an appropriate place through independent study and through online programs in an attempt to get them to speed back up uh, and get to a place where they have the credits. They can do it. Um, you know, we, Zoe Barnum is filled with a, a ton of success stories about students who walk in as a junior and have 40 credits and, and through a lot of hard work and determination get there. Uh, and it may take an extra year, it may take some summertime, it may really take some loading, but it's possible. The, the ability to earn credits quickly is there. Um, they just have to do it. On the front you have Eureka Learning Center and on the back you have Eureka Learning Academy. That's because we changed it about five times. Yeah. And Where do I have Academy? It's actually on the second line. Oh, okay. Not on the oh, there it is. Thank you. And I have to ask about that second Fragment. The Eureka Learning Center is designed to get each and every student to graduation. That's a sentence. Mm -hmm. But utilizing a combination of programs to meet the needs of our students is a fragment. It is. Wow. So it can be by utilizing or? I'm, I'm going to have to say on camera, I believe that Sonny Phillips was on the typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> what, was she not? Yeah. Oh, we will fix that. Just put by utilizing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sandy had to throw you under the bus there. Sandy did a fabulous job. She had like seven other people telling her seven different fixes at seven different times at seven different places, and somehow she did it. Very nice. Um, the question was asked, can we produce these? And the answer is yes. Um, I, I kind of feel like the $6 million man. We have the technology, we have the ability, we can get this done. Um, we, of course, it'll, it'll gloss up, it'll, it'll be a lot prettier. Again, there's some artwork and color that needs to be added to it, but we can get a prototype to the board uh, prior to handing them out. And then um, one of the pieces that, or as, as Sherry was talking about what's already being done over there, um, they're already reaching out to our juniors at Humboldt Bay and letting them know that this is gonna be a program that they're gonna be very successful at. Um, so they're, they're already hearing this, but we're going to get these in students' hands as well, as well as in the community. So, so you're thinking that this will be starting with the start of school in August? Yes. At the Winship site? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that why the name Lincoln is not there at all? <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's part of it, but uh, and I, again, um, you know, we, and, I, and we weren't, we weren't, uh, we weren't really tied to the name, but you know, Eureka Learning Center fits. And, and again, we didn't want to make it a one site kind of place. So like as people read about, if they were to read about the Lincoln Learning Center, they would think that it just takes place there at Lincoln. And, and, we, and we're trying to break down right. those barriers. So we're saying, hey, you can utilize all of Eureka City Schools. We're going to get you there. Plus you can go Eureka Learning Center, Lincoln Campus yeah. or Winship yeah. Campus or at Winship or whatever. Besides, then if we had to move the, the program later on, we wouldn't have to change the polo shirts. <laughs> and, and board member Fullerton will be the first to receive his polo shirt. Okay. Any other comments? Philip? I imagine at some point the public relations is going to have to address in terms of facing out so far. And I thought maybe a good move would be is to contact the living relatives of so far. We've done that. Yeah. yeah. It is our understanding they're not overly attached to the name at the moment. Not if it has the reputation that the business be worth yeah. that was that was a big part of it. Yeah. A lot okay. of people don't even know who so Barnum was, so and the Barnums hardly know. So <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I believe we're at the end of the meeting. There is no um, further closed session, so I, the meeting is now adjourned.
Okay. 